All right, this is Simple Functional Effects with Tag Unions. I'm Richard Feldman. So back in the day, the only way to do effects were side effects. This is sort of the only game in town. And later on, we got managed effects, which are sort of ways to organize your effects, like uh, promises, tasks, futures, things like that. Uh, and then nowadays, we also have effect systems, which are ways to sort of do more than just organize your effects. It's ways to sort of transform them or uh, make them able to be tested more easily, things like that. So today I'm going to talk about one particular effect system, and I'm going to start with the motivation behind this effect system, uh, so some of the examples of things that I'm trying to solve with it. I'm going to talk about tag unions, which are the language feature that sort of underlie the, the characteristics of this uh, effect system, talk about the system itself, and then finally do some comparisons to other effect systems. So let's start with motivation. I want to break this down into three parts. One is testing, another is handling errors, and another is logging. Um, so to give us concrete example here, I'm going to talk about this package downloader. So this is something that I've actually been working on recently. I've been building this programming language called Rock, which I'll talk about more a little bit later. Um, and one of the features in Rock is that you can download packages. Uh, so there's sort of a couple of different steps that this will go through. So one is you specify the URL of the package that you want to download as a dependency. Um, so example.com slash, and then there's a, a little hash there uh, before the, the file extension. And uh, basically what happens is it downloads this compressed tarball from the URL, so this tar.g. Um, before it uh, decompresses it onto your file system, it's actually going to verify the contents against the hash in the URL. So this is sort of a security feature. It's a way to say, okay, um, I'm actually getting the thing that I expected. And this way, if the domain gets compromised or you know taken over later after it expires by somebody else, um, you don't have to worry about uh, this URL suddenly giving you something malicious because if the, you know, the attacker wanted to do that, they would have to change the hash, which in turn would change the URL. Um, and then finally, you know, once it's been verified, we can actually decompress it into a local directory, and now you've got this uh, dependency downloaded. So uh, here's an example of uh, how I, I could write this function. This is kind of a simplified version of the real thing, but it, it performs the same basic steps. This is going to be in Rust because the compiler for Rock is written in Rust, uh, but it could, be, you know, work in any number of different languages. So it's a function called download tarball. It takes a URL as an argument, and then uh, that URL is going to be a string. Um, it's going to return a result of uh, either a hash or an IO error. So if you're not familiar with Rust, uh, this is basically a way of saying either this uh, function is going to return a hash if it's successful. So this hash would be like the actual uh, you know, SHA-256 or whatever else hash of the contents of the tarball. Otherwise, if, if the operation is unsuccessful, then it's going to return an IO error instead. So this would be like if the network was down or you were trying to write, uh, unpack it into a, a file directory that uh, you don't have write permissions to, something like that. Any number of things that, that could go wrong there. Okay, the body of the function, um, again, this is going to be an oversimplified version. Uh, we're going to say let response equals and then do an HTTPS colon colon get on that URL. So this is pretend we have a library called HTTPS. We're going to just go get the contents of this URL and it's going to give us back the response. We're going to do some stuff in between, but then at the very end, the last thing we're going to do is we're going to return the, uh, the hash of this response, so the, the hash of the body. So basically, that's this, this function's job is to download it, and then uh, it's actually going to unpack it in the middle here and then return the hash at the end. So uh, let's say uh, we wanted to you know, decompress it. Um, in order to decompress it, we need to first figure out what is, you know, how is it compressed. So I gave that .tar.gz example earlier. Um, there's actually a couple of different ways that we could specify what the uh, encoding is. So one is looking at the file extension in the URL, so .tar.gz. But also it's entirely possible that we'll get a content encoding header back on the response, and maybe we want to use that instead. So there's a couple of different ways we could infer um, what, what this thing's encoded as, which is important because we need to be able to figure out how we want to decompress it. Um, and then finally, we're going to actually call extract tarball, which will decompress it using the encoding that we got from this get encoding thing that infers it. Um, and then finally, the, uh, the response that has the actual bytes that we're going to decompress and extract onto the file system. Okay, so a couple of different steps to this function. Um, so one of the things that I, I love to do in Rust, and, and this is a very popular strategy, is to add this little question mark right here. Um, so what does that question mark do? Basically, this says, okay, HTTPS get returns a result and this result that this thing is going to return is going to be a little bit different than the one that we are returning from this function. Instead of returning a hash on success, this one's going to return a response on success. But it's still going to return an IO error if something goes wrong. So what this question mark says is, okay, given that I am calling this function and getting back a result, and that result has the same error type as the error type of my function as a whole, you know what I'm going to do is if I get back an error, I'm just going to early return from this function and just go right to the end and return one of these errors. So basically, it's sort of like a, a really, really concise uh, syntax sugar for an early return on error if this thing returns an error. 
Um, so I can do that again uh, down here, basically uh, with this extract tarball. Say like, okay, if this uh, operation again, you know, this could have an IO error on the file system. Uh, like, you know, again, the directory is missing or I don't have re uh, write permissions to it. Um, this question mark will once again early return uh, before we even like run this last line with that error. Cool. So again, very happy with the question mark operator. Use it all the time in Rust. Um, but let's suppose that this get encoding operation, this thing can also fail. Like what if that can uh, fail in the particular way that the encoding just can't be inferred? Like maybe there's no uh, header that would tell me what the encoding is. And there's also the URL doesn't include a file extension. Or maybe it includes one, but it's something that we don't support. It's some encoding that we're not familiar with. And we don't know how to decode that, um, how to decompress it. Well, um, these two, you know, no problem. I can use the question mark operator because they're both returning IO errors and that's what this whole function is. So the early return will just work no problem. But if I try to put a question mark here and this thing's not returning an IO error, it's returning a, I didn't know what kind of encoding this was error. Um, this isn't gonna work. So I can't just use this question mark operator here uh, in Rust. So uh, what can I do instead? Because this doesn't return an IO error. So basically, um, this is the uh, way that I've specified that function's return value. I have this content encoding enum. Uh, and basically, content encoding is I'm saying it's one of these three things. It's either gzip or broadly or uncompressed. Those are like the, the three different content encodings that we support in this system. Um, and this is an enum, which basically means like these are just, you know, they represent unique values. Uh, it's an enumeration, but it's uh, like they're, they're backed by a number, but that doesn't really matter. Um, and I can do things like pattern matching on them and whatnot. Um, so what I can do in order to uh, solve my problem of not being able to use my question mark operator like I want to, is I can make another enum called problem. And this one is actually not just an enumeration. It's basically an enumeration, but some of the uh, values can have payloads associated with them. So this is um, a sum type and uh, different languages call these different things. Rust calls them enums, Haskell calls them algebraic data types, Elm calls them custom types. Uh, I think this other languages call them variants. Um, uh, F-sharp calls them discriminated unions. A lot of different names for these things. Um, but basically they're all, they all fall under the umbrella of a, a sum type as opposed to like a product type, which would be like a struct or a record or something like that. So this sum type basically says I have two different variants here. One is I have the IO variant and the other is I have the encoding variant. And basically the IO variant says, okay, if we have a uh, IO problem, then we're gonna store an IO error inside of that as the payload. And if we have an encoding problem, then I'm gonna uh, encode uh, some sort of encoding error, which would say, you know, it wasn't one of these three content encodings that we support. So this problem enum, this problem sum type that we've got here, uh, this lets us solve the problem of these sort of uh, two conflicting question marks. And basically what I can do is I can say, okay, this one returns a result of a response and IO error, and this one returns a result of encoding and encoding error. Um, I can use this enum to turn them into the same thing using this map error uh, method that, that Rust supports. So map error of IO basically says, okay, this is gonna give me back an IO error. I'm gonna wrap that up in one of these. This gives me back an encoding error. I'm gonna wrap that up in one of these. And now both of these things are returning a problem and therefore I can use question mark on them because they're both going to do an early return of the same type. Now, of course, if I'm doing that, then I do need to actually you know, go back and change my overall function to no longer take an I, have, return an IO error, but rather to return a problem. So this works. Okay, cool. So what I like about this system that I have in Rust is number one, errors are always visible in the type. Like I can always see at a glance, any operation, like how can it possibly fail? That's really important to me and really valuable to me. Um, also, I can't accidentally forget to handle errors. Like there are some languages where it's pretty easy to accidentally just like swallow an error and not, uh, you know, <laughs> and, and not handle it at all. And then it just results in a crash for the user. No problem here. Um, map error also lets me tag errors with my own information. So here I was using it to, as sort of a workaround for the fact that I wanted to use question mark on two different error types. But another thing I can do with it is, let's say I had a couple of different HTTP errors and I wanted to be able to distinguish between them because I wanted to show the user like different error messages depending on which one failed. That's another use of map errors. I can uh, sort of use that to tag things and say like, oh yes, uh, this one was, you know, this particular error, uh, at this stage in the pipeline, and this one was this other one. Um, I like all those things. I also like, uh, of course, that the question mark operator lets me short circuit easily. Um, if I have some error, I can, you know, very easily short circuit to the end of the function without having to, you know, write a bunch of conditionals everywhere. Um, but there are some things that I dislike about this system. So number one is as soon as I introduce a second error type, I have to do map error on every single one of the errors like I did here with, with problem. Now granted there are in Rust like other uh, ways that you can do this, but this is kind of the, the one that comes out the box. Otherwise you have to sort of go to like a third party library. Um, so I, I also don't like having to go to a third party library for error handling. Um, 
So this is a little bit uh, unergonomic from my perspective. Um, it also promotes these sort of overbroad errors. So uh, like this IO error, you notice it was the same error type for um, file handling as well as for HTTP. This is a pretty common thing in Rust is that you see IO error use, being used for a lot of things, which means that you can get like, you know, in your file uh, handling example, like file IO, like reading from a file, writing to a file can potentially come back at you and say, hey, there was an address and use error which doesn't make any sense. Like, you know, that's that's not something that happens on the file system, really. Um, that's that's more of a network thing. But it can happen because there is, it's this sort of overbroad type. And so there's this, this sort of tension between you want to use like a, a broad error type so that your question mark just works everywhere and you don't have to create one of these wrapper problem types. But on the other hand, as soon as you do that, you start to get these errors that you know can't really happen in practice, uh, but which are still coming through the system anyway. Um, and then finally, uh, it is kind of easy to miss the, you know, the question mark operator being an early return. I've definitely had it happen in Rust where I had some logic at the beginning of my function that was using a question mark and I just visually didn't, didn't notice it. And I was trying to figure out why my function was not getting as far as I thought it was going to be. Uh, and it was because I had a question mark that I, I, I didn't notice. Um, now the testing story for this uh, really kind of varies based on what we're doing. So when I'm doing this get encoding function, uh, which you know takes the URL and the header and then returns this content encoding you know, based on looking at the URL and the header, um, uh, this is a pure function. So testing it is super easy. I just call it and I check the return value. Um, it, it's not depending on any external state. It's not you know writing to any external state. Uh, it's just no problem at all to test it. Um, now, in, contact, uh, in contrast, this sort of download tarball function that's doing the HTTP effects and the, uh, and the IO effects to, to write to the file system, um, all these side effects make it a lot harder to test. Um, you know, because calling it actually runs the effects, uh, I have all these new things to consider. Like, for example, do I want to spin up a local server to make sure that what I'm downloading from is actually going to be available so that my tests don't fail or maybe time out or flake in other ways uh, because this remote URL that I'm using for testing might happen to be down. Um, if I am spinning up local servers, I have to make sure that they're not on uh, the same port if I want to run my tests in parallel, because otherwise they're going to get conflicts and some of my tests are going to fail. Um, I'm writing to the file system. Now I need to potentially be able to write to a temp directory. And so I need to you know, maybe add another argument to this function for like what directory I want to put it in so that I'm not writing to my actual real long-term durable file system just because I'm running tests. So there's all these additional considerations that come in. And really, uh, you know, the testing stuff that has effects in Rust is a kind of a whole different ball game from testing pure functions. Um, and finally, we have this uh, logging use case. Now, granted, this is more something that I want for like web servers, but I'll use this downloader example because it's you know a pretty straightforward example. Um, basically, if I you know pretend that this was on a web server, um, I would want to be logging pretty much any kind of I/O operation that's happening, um, because oftentimes I will come back after the fact some bug happened, and I'm trying to figure out like what happened, what was actually going on on the system, uh, or maybe I want to do diagnostics on like how long are things taking. And kind of the easiest way to do this is to just log all of your effects as a matter of course and just write down like what database query was happening, what network requests were happening, how long did they take to, to come back. Um, one way I could do this is I could write wrappers around, you know, all these th functions and just have sort of you dis use discipline to say every single time I'm going to do an HTTPS get, don't use this library directly, but rather, uh, you know, make sure that I'm calling our wrapper and just have a policy of doing that. But, you know, it's kind of uh, easy to accidentally forget to do that sometimes um, or just otherwise to have, uh, you know, mistakes can happen uh, when you're doing something like that, um, like relying on using a wrapper everywhere. So that can work. But really what I would kind of ideally like is some centralized way that's sort of guaranteed to say every single effect that is happening going through the system on my web server is definitely going to be logged. And I know that nothing is getting missed. Um, so this is sort of what I'd really like is like different errors accumulate automatically. Uh, so I don't have to do this like problem wrapper just because I, I mix and match two different error types. Um, I would love to have testing be as easy as testing pure functions, like not having to spin up these local servers or, you know, uh, create tempters on my file system. I would love to be able to just say, you know, hey, run my tests and, uh, and, and also ideally, you know, not have to like <laughs> mock a bunch of things either. Um, I'd also love to have like automatic centralized logging of all my IO operations. Uh, so my web server, I, I don't have to worry that I, you know, missed a wrapper here or there. I can just say, yep, no, every single one of my IO things is running through this centralized log logging logic. And just, I'm guaranteed that everything is getting logged. Um, okay, so let's start talking about like how to solve some of these motivating problems. Um, so I'm gonna start by talking about tag unions, just sort of explaining what the feature is. Uh, they're anonymous sum types that allow accumulating and also uh, pattern matching with exhaustiveness checking. Um, Tag unions are a feature of the uh, Rock programming language, which is definitely a work in progress. So I'm going to talk about stuff that you know you can 
go try out today if you want to go visit rocklang.org and try them out. Um, but uh, fair warning, this is not something that I recommend you know doing in production. Um, having said that, the techniques that I'm going to talk about here with tag unions, this is the way that I'm most familiar with doing it because I've been doing it in Rock. Um, but this can be done in other languages. Like OCaml has polymorphic variants, which let you do this. Um, also, like uh, languages that have um, uh, Union types, uh, so like TypeScript or like Sorbet for Ruby, um, that's also a way that you can uh, you can do something similar. Um, so everything that I'm going to say here is going to be Rock specific, but it's not confined to Rock from a technique perspective. Um, okay, so Rock is a purely functional programming language. It compiles to machine code or to WebAssembly. It has a really heavy emphasis on performance, um, uh, runtime performance as well as compile time performance, um, and the type system includes uh, tag unions, which we're going to talk about now. Okay. So the first thing to know about uh, tag unions are tags. So here are some examples of tags. I can say color equals green. I've just made a tag called green. I don't need to define anything up front. I'm just saying color equals green. And because green is capitalized, that means it's a tag. So anything that's capitalized in ROG is going to be a, a, a tag. I can also say color equals red. I can also say color equals gold. Now, by default, each of these are just sort of standalone tags. But if I want, I can add a type annotation that says these tags are actually part of a tag union. So here's what that would look like. So basically, I'm now saying each of these different definitions of color, uh, it, and these would not be coexisting, right? These would be like in different files, maybe, or something like that. Um, these are part of a tag union of the red tag, the green tag, and the gold tag. And basically, this tag union is another some type, like Rust enums that we saw earlier, um, where I'm saying, OK, these are the three different alternatives that you can have here. You can have red, green, or you can have gold, and that's it. Um, now, again, uh, these are anonymous, so if I wanted to, I don't have to have those type annotations. I could just have these as standalone. That would totally work. But also, optionally, you can add uh, type annotations if you want. Rock has a 100% type inference, um, so you never have to put type annotations if you don't want to. Um, but uh, th this is something that you can do if you want to sort of like add a restriction or just add some documentation. Um, now, if I were to say uh, color has to be either red, green, or gold, and then I put blue in here, this would not work. This would give me a type mismatch saying that, no, you, you've annotated this saying it's got to be one of these three, and it wasn't. Therefore, uh, you're, you're going to get a, a type mismatch. Um, now, one of the important features of tag unions is that when you use them in conditionals, they accumulate. So here I can say color equals, and then if x is greater than 0, then green, else gold. So the compiler will actually infer a type of this as that color is the tag union green comma gold, meaning that this can be either green or gold, which is true, because depending on which branch of the conditional it takes, it could be one of either of these. Um, Similarly, you can kind of go the other way around and do pattern matching on these. And then, uh, so here we have a two string, which is, this is a um, rock function syntax. It says, give me a color as my argument. And then I will do when color is, that's our pattern matching syntax. Uh, and then we say red, arrow red. So this basically means like, if the color is the tag red, then return the string red. If it's green, return the string green, gold, etc. cetera. Um, and the compiler will infer the type of this function to be red comma green comma gold. And then uh, it'll return a string. So this is basically saying, OK, not because you actually instantiated one of these color values, but rather because of how you are pattern matching on these, uh, I can infer that uh, th these are the only three options that are possible here. Um, now, if I wrote this type annotation and I left off one of these options, like I said, OK, this could be red or green or gold, but I'm only going to list these two possibilities. I would actually get a compile time error. Um, it would look like this. It would say unsafe pattern. This is like the, the actual compile error. Um, if you're a fan of the Elm programming language, this might look familiar to you because uh, Rock is a direct descendant of Elm. And one of the things that Elm is really great at is uh, having really nicely uh, displayed error messages. And we like to try and do that too and try to um, live up to that standard of like really high quality error messages. Um, so unsafe pattern. This when does not cover all the possibilities. Other possibilities include gold. I would have to crash if I saw one of those. So add branches for them. Um, so basically, uh, you know, that, that's, that's uh, exhaustiveness checking, as they say, um, making sure that all the patterns are covered. Um, another thing you can do is you can add uh, payloads to tags. Um, so here we have an example of, I could say red, green, and then also other. And then, uh, you know, if other contains a particular string, then I would return other. And then this is our string interpolation syntax. Uh, then just put that string inside there. OK. Um, and then the, right, the inferred type for this would be uh, red, green, and then other, which is which has a payload of a string. So this is kind of similar to you remember with Rust, we saw like problem had a, a payload. Um, this is an example of other having a, a payload, the other tag. But red and green do not have payloads. Only other has a payload in this example. So it's kind of a bread and butter uh, feature of some types. <clears throat> okay. Um, oh yeah. And then uh, this is how I would uh, if I wanted to call two string uh, passing an actual other tag. This is how I would actually like instantiate one of these and, and put the payload inside of it. All right, so to summarize, uh, tag unions are anonymous some types. Um, they can have payloads. Uh, they can do exhaustive pattern matching. And also, tags accumulate across conditional branches. 
So this might so far seem like, okay, well, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a neat feature, but what does that have to do with effects? I mean, what, how do you build an effect system on top of this? So let's talk about that. Um, so I'm gonna start off with just a, an example of some, uh, some IO using this system in, in rock code. I'm gonna talk about error handling, and then finally the internal representation and some of the uh, performance characteristics. Okay, so uh, for this IO example, I wanna start with just uh, three different functions that we're gonna use inside of it. And I wanna show you what the types of these functions are in this effect system. So this is the HTTP.getBytes. So HTTP is the name of the module. Um, it takes a URL and then it returns a task, which has uh, two different type parameters. One is bytes and the other is HTTP error. So task in rock is similar to result in Rust. Now in result, uh, sorry, in Rust, result is basically saying this operation could return one of these two things but it's not really saying anything about whether this operation does any side effects. Um, in Rust, just anything can do side effects. In Rock, that's not true. So Rock actually does have a result type, uh, but in Rock, that's kind of only used for pure functions. Like if there's a result that does not tell you anything about whether it's doing any effects, uh, but task does. Task says this is doing an effect. So if you see a result that's not doing an effect, uh, task is saying this is actually going to perform an effect. So task uh, like result has two different type parameters. One is uh, what happens if it succeeds, just like in Rust. So if it succeeds, this task is going to give us some bytes. If the task fails, it's going to give us an HTTP error. Okay. Oh, the HTTP error, by the way, uh, is going to be uh, represented by a tag union. Um, then we also have the file.exists function. Uh, so this is in the file module instead of the HTTP module. Um, this is going to take a path and then return a task. This task produces a Boolean on success. And then otherwise, it gives us a file metadata error. So in other words, like we were trying to read the metadata of the file to see if it exists. It wasn't there, so we got a metadata error. And then finally, file.writeBytes, which takes a path and some bytes and then returns a task. This task doesn't produce anything. So we have just an empty record in there. So it's like, hey, uh, I don't produce anything. Um, nothing useful. Uh, and then this gives us a file write error if, uh, if it errors out. So notice, by the way, that in Rust, we had we would have had IO error for all three of these. But in Rock, we actually can have these more precise errors, uh, HTTP error, metadata error, and write error. Now in Rust, that would be inconvenient because it would mean that I couldn't use sort of my question mark short circuiting for all three of these. Um, I would have to wrap them all up in, in problem every time. That would be pretty annoying. Um, so it would be nice that I would get these more precise errors and I wouldn't see like address in use for my metadata error or like, you know, can't write to file in my metadata error. Um, but uh, but it would mean that I was uh, sort of in tension with you know, the, the convenience of the question mark operator short circuiting. Okay, so here's our rock code uh, that we're actually using. Let me just walk you through what this is doing. So basically, uh, this is a function called download, and I'm starting by checking to see if this uh, file name exists on the file system. And basically what we're doing here is we're saying, okay, if you've already downloaded this thing in the past and it's, we've already got it downloaded, let's not bother downloading it again. We've already got it cached, so don't need to, don't need to do that work. So we're saying exists, arrow, I'm not gonna go into exactly what the arrow syntax does or what this pipe syntax does. Uh, <laughs> don't have time to throw like a full rock syntax tutorial, but basically what this line of code is doing is saying, okay, if the file name exists, uh, we're going to uh, return, um, like the Boolean is gonna become this exists variable. Um, and then uh, we're piping that to task.await. And this kind of works like you would expect an async await where it's going to, you know, await for this thing to, to this IO operation to finish. Um, and this can be used in an async context, of course. Um, as you might guess from the name. <laughs> um, once we've got this exists variable, uh, we're gonna do if exists then, so in other words, if the, if the, the file did exist, then we're just gonna say task.succeed with uh, empty record, basically meaning like, okay, we're done, we succeeded, uh, noth no, nothing else to report, no other information. Um, otherwise, we're going to do an http.getbytes on this given URL to download and extract the, the whole thing. Um, let's pretend that we were actually, you know, calling the, the whole like extract uh, functionality that we showed earlier in Rust. Uh, but basically, you know, in this example, we're just gonna just pretend we just download it without any of that decompression stuff. Um, and then once we've got the tarball, we're going to say file.writeBytes uh, file name and tarball to actually write the bytes that we downloaded into this particular uh, file name since it didn't already exist. Cool. Um, one thing to note about this is that this task.await stuff, this is actually short circuiting on error, just like Rust's question mark operator. So if this thing fails, it's going to short circuit and early return this entire function, uh, you know, with that error. But a difference between this and Rust's question mark operator is that you might notice that, again, we have these mixing and matching, right? File.exists returns a metadata error if it, if it doesn't uh, succeed. Get bytes returns an HTTP error. Write bytes returns a write error. So if task.await uh, short circuits on error, like, and we have these three different error types here, how is this possible that, that we're, we're able to do that when in Rust, as in lots of other languages, um, you need to have a consistent type there? 
Well, this comes back to tag unions and how tag unions can accumulate. If you get uh, multiple of them in like a conditional, and spoiler alert, TAS.await is actually using um, a conditional under the hood. Uh, so it's able to just sort of combine these and union them together. So the result of all this means that uh, when we're doing this, uh, you can do this task.attempt, which basically turns your task into a result. And then you can basically say like, okay, when the result is, and let's pretend we already checked to make sure that it's okay, and uh, rather this is an error. Um, if we know that this is already an error, then we can just basically do one of these exhaustive pattern matches and say, oh, well, okay, if it's an HTTP error, then here's our URL and here's our problem. Let's handle that. If it's a file rate error, handle that. If it's a file metadata error, handle that. And if I did one more type of I.O. back up in my uh, you know, earlier code where I, I you know, let's say we wanted to do a file read, then file read error would just appear in here. If I wanted to uh, you know, tag them to say I wanted to have you know, multiple HTTP errors um, uh, you know, from, uh, for, for different HTTP operations, I could do map error just like I can in Rust and that tag would just appear in here. Also, again, this has exhaustiveness checking. So if there were an error type that was uh, potentially could happen up above and I didn't include it in this match, I would get an exhaustiveness error. I would get, like the compiler would say, hey, you didn't handle, let's say, HTTP error. You handled file write error and file metadata error, but HTTP error could happen here and you didn't handle it. So I really love how this, this works because it means that, you know, not only do I not need a question mark operator, but um, I, I don't have to worry about like uh, mixing and matching things and sort of like creating these wrapper types. I can just use whatever effects that I have. They can have whatever errors they have. And yet I still get to sort of concisely handle them all in one place uh, with short circuiting. So I'm a big fan of like uh, how the sort of exhaustiveness checking here and the short circuiting all sort of plays together in this effect system. Um, okay, cool. So um, something else to note is uh, let, let's say that I wanted to, uh, I'm gonna rewrite this uh, to be a little bit more vertical here. So this is the same code. I've just uh, made it like more, more vertically styled. Um, so let's say that I wanted to, uh, to, to make one of these uh, HTTP errors like tagged. Um, this is what that would look like. So I, I add just a little pipe to task.map error. And then again, because these are anonymous, I don't need to declare anything up front. I can just make up this name for a tag, download tarball. And because I did that, now when I do my pattern match, I just basically have exactly what I have before, except I put download tarball in front and that's it. And then the rest of it, HTTP error URL problem is all the same. Um, so again, this, this is really concise to like tag these things. Uh, so I, I don't even need to declare, you know, anything up front. I can just sort of write my code, um, and everything just sort of, uh, works out nicely. Um, great. Uh, and so again, this, you know, if I were doing something like IO error, um, I would have, uh, one of two things would be true. Either I would have all of these things. If I wanted to like tag one of these, I would have to wrap all of them in some sort of new problem. Uh, and or I would need to potentially, you know, just at a baseline, have all of these different use cases be like just one giant blob of all the possible IO errors instead of having them be a lot more specific and precise like this. So I'm only having to handle the particular problems that actually could come up for each of these different scenarios. Okay, um, for this next part uh, of how the system works, I need to give a quick shout out to William Brandon, uh, exists underscore for all on Twitter. Um, and you can find him on GitHub and other places. Uh, he's a, a researcher at MIT. Um, I did not actually know about the technique I'm about to talk to you about, <laughs> uh, but he just clued me into this very recently. And um, at least as of this recording, I have not uh, implemented it completely. So I, I am basically uh, sort of done a proof of concept that you know, the types work out, but I haven't actually like implemented this for real. Um, but I'm very, very excited to because of what it means, especially for performance. Um, so thank you so much, William, for, uh, for cluing me into this. <laughs> um, okay, so we talked about uh, like HTTP get bytes, uh, file.exists, and file.write bytes. Um, here's how we're going to represent these things under the hood. And I say going to because this is a future tense thing, haven't done this yet, but um, this is a way that you can do this that makes for a very, very powerful implementation. So we're gonna find this new tag union called operation. And again, this is just gonna be the same, same thing as before. This, this whole talk is all tag unions. Um, and it's gonna be these square brackets, meaning that everything in between here is just going to be some uh, tag unions. Uh, sorry, some, some tags. Um, this is the union. Okay, so I'm gonna just, just as a reference, I'm gonna put this comment of like, here's what the get bytes type was. So you can remember this is like what we're sort of building up to. Um, but this operation thing is basically going to represent, here is the concept of doing one of these get bytes. It's not actually a function. It's just a representation of, let's say that you, the user represented this. This is what we can actually put inside that task to represent that that's what they asked for. So we're gonna start by saying, okay, this is an HTTP get bytes uh, tag. It's got a URL that the user passed in as, as one of its payloads. But it's actually got another payload, which we'll come back to in a second, which is this function. And this function is gonna be a tag of either okay or error. 
This is actually called Result in Rock, just like it is in, in Rust, but I figured I'd just show that Result in Rock is just another tag union. So again, it's, it's all tag unions all the way. Um, so basically, uh, if it's okay, then we get some bytes. And if it's an error, we have an HTTP error, just like we talked about earlier. Now, this is actually a function which takes one of these and then returns another operation. So basically what this represents is, okay, let's say we're, uh, we're going through and we're iterating through one of these things and we encounter one of these and we say, I wanna run an actual HTTP request to get the bytes from this URL. Once that comes back, I'm going to say, okay, I'm gonna call this function given those bytes that I got back or this error that I got back. And then based on what this thing gives me back, I'm going to uh, you know, have a new operation to get. So this is actually gonna, what we're building up to here is a state machine, and that's the transition between them. So I'm gonna give another example of file.exists. So here we would say file exists as the tag, um, path uh, being the path that the user passed in. Um, and then once again, we have this sort of result. If it's okay, then uh, we, we're gonna give the Boolean of that the uh, file existed or not. Otherwise we can have an error, uh, file.metadata error. And then again, this is gonna return a new operation. So you can imagine if we were running a loop of these things, you know, and just dot, 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 we have all the different operations listed that are possible in this effect system. I can just loop over these and say, okay, well, I, I've, I've encountered one of these, great. I'm gonna actually go and do that. And this is very async friendly because you could just go and do this, you know, on a background thread or something like that, or using IOU ring on Linux, whatever. Um, and then once I get the response back, I can say, oh, cool. I have this, this callback function just sort of hanging around for what to do next. And I can just call it passing the result of what actually happened uh, for that IO operation. And it's gonna give back another operation. So then I loop back and I just do the whole thing over again. Look, look, at, look at what operation I got. Oh, this time it was a file exists. Great. I'll just go ahead and do that. So basically inside each of these tasks is one of these operation things, which both contains what to do and then what to do next after that operation completes. And so essentially the way that the implementation of this, uh, this effect system is able to work is by basically taking, saying, take the task, unwrap the operation from within the task, um, run it, and then run the continuation to figure out like what, what step to do next. Um, Cool. Okay, um, I'm gonna very briefly show uh, an example of, uh, oh yeah, sorry. So an important <laughs> characteristic of this is that this is simulatable because not only can I do this like uh, for purposes of actually implementing the, the real effects, but of course, if I want to in user space, I can write a simulation test that says, hey, just like let me walk through these operations and without actually doing any real effects, just say like, oh, okay, well, first I expect that this thing will do an HTTP get bytes. And I can just simulate it by saying, I'm gonna, um, given the URL, I'm going to tell you what that uh, result was. I'm gonna tell you that it got these bytes back magically. No server to spin up, uh, nothing like that. And then when I get to like file write bytes, I can say, oh, well, uh, you've said that you wrote this to the file system. Great, I'm gonna make a little fake in memory file system um, that doesn't even have to use a tempter. And then when you try to do a read from it later, I'll say, oh, yes, 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 you got these bytes back. So it's sort of like a way of uh, mocking, but in a very minimalistic way, where you're really just simulating the bare minimum of, of what happens at each step. You don't actually need to like mock the entire world just in case something gets called. You know exactly what got called because you have it in this very straightforward data structure that you can just sort of uh, iterate over. Um, you can also put like various different uh, APIs on top of this. I have some ideas, uh, but haven't actually tried them out yet for, for how to make like a really nice simulation API. Um, other thing about this is that it's loggable. Again, you know, the, when you're just traversing this data structure, uh, you're able to just say, hey, you know what? Not only am I gonna do the HTTP.getBytes that you requested, but also behind the scenes, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, log that you did that. Oh, I see that you did a file exist operation. Great, behind the scenes, I'm going to go and uh, not only do that, but also like record that you, you did one of those, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And again, with exhaustiveness checking, I can make sure that every single possible operation that, that is supported by this system is going to include that logging in addition to, to performing the effect that it wants. Also, you compl have complete control of the interaction between these two. During your simulation tests, maybe you don't wanna bother uh, simulating all the logging. You wanna just say, hey, just ignore all those logging things. Totally no problem, you can do that too. Um, so this is a really powerful thing. And a lot of effect systems have this. I'm, I'm by no means saying that, uh, that this is like unique to the, the effect system we're talking about here. But what's cool about it is that it's really simple. It's really simple, it's really ergonomic, and yet it still gets you all this power. Um, very briefly, I'm gonna show you uh, how the task wrapper works for, for this. Um, we're not gonna dwell on this because honestly, this kind of like is mind bending to me. Um, but in case you're wondering, uh, this is sort of like how, how, it, how it translates from uh, that uh, operation based sort of under the hood API to the actual task based API that, um, that the end user actually interacts with. So basically you have this task type, it's got an okay type and an error type. Uh, and this is um, essentially a function 
which takes another function, and that other function takes a result, so okay, an error, and returns an operation, and then that whole function that takes one of these functions as an argument returns an operation. This broke my brain. I don't know if you look at that and you're like, oh yes, that's very intuitive. I understand exactly how that, you know, how that works. Um, more power to you. I didn't get it when I, when I first saw it. I had to like stare at it a bunch and then like, uh, even still, I, I am still very shocked that, that this actually works out. Um, here's how Succeed is implemented. I had to ask William how to do this because I was like, I, how would you even implement that in this, in this world? Um, here's the type of await. Um, so it is a little bit magical, I have to admit. This part I, I don't think is simple, um, but the nice part is that um, end users of this effect system don't have to be confronted with this. They just see, oh, it's a task. You know, it's very simple, the stuff that I showed earlier, all you know is the external stuff that's like going on here, and you can wrap this up in an opaque type in rock so that like you know, users don't even see the, the internals uh, of the guts. Um, and then also on the other side, when you're actually implementing the you know the, the state machine, the operation type is also very simple. So um, the intermediate glue is not, but uh, fortunately that's you know not something that everybody needs to uh, engage with. Um, and again, all of this is still simulatable and loggable because you can go from a task to an operation. That's kind of the whole point. Cool. Okay, one other thing I want to note about this system, um, and this is something where I don't want to claim that this is a good idea, but I will claim that this is something you can do. Um, so let's say I have my like HTTP.getBytes, uh, file.exists, file.writeBytes. Uh, here we have task that has one uh, type parameter, um, sorry, uh, two type parameters. So one type parameter for the, uh, the success type and then one for the error type. Um, something you can do if you want is you can add a third type, which describes this is what type of effect uh, this thing does. So you could say, for example, this does a network effect. This does a file read effect. This does a file write effect. And in exactly the same way as how these errors accumulate, if you just take the exact same code that we did earlier, uh, and, and, and you know where we were just uh, you know writing this operation that used all three of these things and they just automatically accumulated their errors, these will accumulate as well. And so what you'll get out of that is you'll get not only uh, you know this this operation you know does these errors, but even after you've handled the errors, this will say. This task, this like combined task that's made from composing together these uh, these other subtasks with uh, task.await, it has network effects, it has file read effects, and it has file write effects. So we'll just sort of tell you in the type, here are exactly all the different types of effects that this operation does. Which means that you know as your program gets bigger and bigger, you can look at a given type signature and say, oh, I see that this thing does a task. And more specifically, I can see that this does network tasks and file read tasks, but not file write tasks, because those don't appear in the type. And that, that will be sort of completely enforced by the type system. You can never forget one of these, or else you'll get a, a type mismatch. It'll say, hey, this you know <laughs> did one of these network things, but I didn't see network listed in there, so you need to add that to your type. Um, and it's also completely inferred. So if you don't want to, you could just uh, you know leave an underscore there, which underscore type basically means, hey, you know, I don't want to feel like annotating this type right now. Uh, but you know, the, the type system is still tracking it. It's not like an any type. Um, it's just like, hey, uh, you know, I don't care about this right now. Um, like I said, I'm not sure that this is actually a good idea. It might not be worth like the extra verbosity and complexity and tracking. But I wanted to note that this is something that you can do with tag unions uh, when you're making an effect system like this. Okay, finally, I want to talk very briefly about the uh, runtime representation of this. Um, so I mentioned that, like, you know, that you have this operation type. It lists, it's a tag union that lists, like, all the different operations that are possible. Each one of them, crucially, ends in a function that says, uh, here's how we go um, from this to the next operation, uh, it, you know, in, in the, sort of the next step in the state machine. Um, how is this actually represented at runtime? Um, and so basically, uh, you know, this this sort of uh, uh oh yeah and then you have the the task wrapper around that which ultimately just gets uh, translated to an operation um essentially it's just tag unions and functions so the the question of like how does this get represented at runtime really comes down to how do you represent tag unions or or you know some types in whatever language you're using um and and functions and in the case of rock fortunately the answer is um very, very efficiently is how these are represented. So uh, actually like Rust and C++, Rock does represent these things uh, using sort of monomorphized stack allocated data structures that are about as efficient as they possibly could be. Um, so for tag unions, these get uh, monomorphized all the way down to basically C structs uh, and unions. Um, and then uh, for functions, we actually uh, stack allocate our closures too. So we monomorphize them all the way down such that uh, they don't even have a heap allocation. Which is to say in layman's terms, Basically, the rock runtime representation of this is like the same as the Rust runtime representation. It's almost exactly as efficient, um, which is pretty cool because uh, this is actually how Rust does its async state machines. Like when you use the async keyword in Rust, it basically compiles all the way down to 
essentially this uh, <laughs> this exact data structure. Um, and you know, this is kind of assuming that all this task, like the function wrapping will get inlined away, which since I haven't actually implemented this yet, I don't know if that'll get inlined away, but even if it does, their stack allocated functions, the overhead should be pretty minimal. So we're kind of expecting that the overall overhead of this effect system is going to be basically equivalent to the overall overhead of async rust, which is to say, about as minimal as possible because their goal in designing async rust was quote you couldn't do better if you wrote it by hand in like assembly um so very excited to be able to actually uh, benchmark this but like i said doesn't quite uh, the implementation doesn't exist yet so take everything i'm saying with a grain of salt this definitely works from a tight perspective but uh, that's all i can say so far <laughs> um Cool. Um, so yeah, so since rock tag unions are C tag unions, no heap allocations by default, and closures are basically implemented as tag unions under the hood, so also uh, no uh, no heap allocations, um, basically we, we end up with something that's essentially like Rust's uh, async state machine. Okay, and finally, I'm going to very briefly talk about some comparisons to other languages. Um, there are a lot of different effect systems out there. Uh, so there's like ones in the standard libraries, third-party effect systems, algebraic effects in, in some languages now. Um, unfortunately, don't have time to compare to all of those. So basically, I'm just going to real quick run through sort of a summary of the capabilities of what this effect system gets you. Um, so it does get you simulation testing, which is one of our main goals. Errors accumulate automatically, also one of the motivations. Um, can't forget to handle errors, also important. Uh, can track, which affects the task may perform. Again, not sure exactly if this is a good idea or not. may not be worth the complexity, but it's something that it is capable of doing if you want to. Um, and finally, of course, you can use map error to tag custom error types. Um, Non-capabilities. So some other effect systems do have this, like uh, they have ways to sort of compose um, like task-like errors with non-task effects. Like this is something I believe you can do in algebraic effects, um, not something that supports. Everything's just, you know, it's just tasks within tasks. Um, calling effect effectual functions with the same syntax as calling uh, non-effectual functions. Again, not something you can do. You saw we had that little like left arrow syntax uh, for, for uh, composing the other effects. That's that's uh, something that you have to do. You, you don't have the ability to just say like, oh yes, X equals, and then like run this task. That's not something that this, this get, gets you. Um, and also it doesn't give you quote unquote colorless effectual functions. Uh, so in other words, there is a type change when you wanna do effects. Like you are, you do have to say, this returns a task rather than a result. Um, so these are, the, you know, there's a trade off there, which is to say, um, you know, you do get to know just by looking at the type, whether or not effects are involved. So this is one of the things that I like about this system. But admittedly, a downside is that if you do want Want to change something that's like very deeply nested into uh, something that you know is going to perform effects, you do have to do some work to go change all the colors to, to return task instead of result or whatever the case may be. Um, in terms of ergonomics, uh, you know, I think this is a very simple, you know, very gentle learning curve uh, compared to some of the other effect systems that I've seen out there. Um, it has a similar verbosity to async await, so you do have to, you know, do that like pipe to task dot await. Uh, like in Rust, you would just say dot await, so that's like slightly <laughs> less verbose, but you know, basically pretty similar. Like every time you're going to do one of these, you're you're going to need to say like you know await it essentially. Um, which I consider to be pretty reasonable ergonomics. Um, and also, especially, you know, the, the thing that I really love about this is that the error accumulation just works. Like you don't have to wrap things in problem and yet you get all the benefits of uh, you know, the, the rest of uh, Rust's like um, error handling system. Um, performance, when it comes to tag unions, basically it's like the performance of any other some type in your language. So depending on what language you're implementing this system in, um, you know, it really kind of comes down to like, how are your anonymous some types implemented? Like polymorphic variants in OCaml um, probably have a different, actually I know they have a different runtime representation than Rock because OCaml doesn't monomorphize. Um, so in Rock's case, this is basically the same performance as Rust enums. It's like literally the, the, we compile the same stuff, give or take some optimizations that uh, Rust has. Um, and of course, this could be done with like union types in other languages, like in TypeScript or, or Ruby with Sorbet and stuff like that. Um, as far as the state machine performance goes, again, depends on how the language represents closures. Um, so rocks are not heap allocated. Very unusual for a high level language with automatic memory management. In fact, uh, the only other one that I know of that does this is Milton. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> unusual, but, uh, but normally uh, you would have to sort of pay for at least one uh, heap allocation per state in the state machine. Um, and then of course, uh, the, this task wrapper performance, like I mentioned earlier, does kind of depend on how much inlining we're doing. And we'll find out in practice when we actually implement this, uh, <laughs> how, much it, uh, how much it actually gets to inline. Hopefully all of it. Um, and finally, the performance of the effects themselves. Um, effects in Rock can be written low-level system languages. Uh, this gets into Rock's sort of platforms and applications design, which is outside the scope of this talk. Um, but it means that basically when you get to like, you know, file read, like IO, like uh, 
operations like that, you're probably going to be looking at you know C or Rust levels of overhead. So very, very minimal. Um, languages with CFFI could do the same thing if they wanted to. So you could basically have like CFFI to just interpret that state machine if you wanted to. Um, but uh, you know that that really is kind of up to you how you want to implement the low level stuff. If you want, you could just use like you know normal standard library IO stuff. Okay. So summarize everything we talked about. Um, started with talking about motivation. So we wanted to uh, have a better story around testing and handling errors and logging. Um, basically talked about tag unions are anonymous subtypes, uh, you know, but any language with anonymous subtypes, you can presumably do the same thing uh, th This uh, as this uh, effect system. Um, tags can have payloads, that's very important. Uh, they have exhaustive pattern matching, also important, and they accumulate across conditional branches, which is how we get the really nice error accumulation behavior, and if you want to, the accumulating the uh, effect type as well. Um, we gave this example of like sort of uh, mixing and matching different um, different types of effect errors and then seeing how uh, we were able to still do exhaustive pattern matching at the end to cover all the error cases, uh, you know, without having to do this like wrapper problem type. Um, we talked about how the exhaustiveness uh, matching gives us like an error if we forget to cover something. Um, and there's kind of like no way around that as long as we're, uh, you know, using this, this system. Um, and then finally, we talked about uh, sort of the uh, the actual implementation under the hood of where we're pattern matching on this operation to make this state machine, which is very nice in that it's simulatable. Uh, we can write simulation tests that don't actually do the real effect uh, quite easily. And it's also loggable. We can make sure that, again, using exhaustiveness checking, that we don't forget to cover any possible effect and make sure that you know on our web server, for example, we're always logging every single effect that, that uh, comes through the system. Um, OK, and so this has been Simple Functional Effects with Tag Unions. Thanks very much.